Good, everyone. I'm Suzanne Perez Poole from the Oakwood Institute of Computer and Ability, and I'm here with Daniel and Shaquan from the National Institute of Computational Sciences, and we're going to talk to you today about the art of file transfers. Everything that we say applies to all of our centers, so that's at the Oakwood Institute of Computing Facility at National Institute of Computing. There's no style feature on WebEx. Uh, it will help you uh, to Daniel, and he can get me to repeat the question so that everyone that's on the phone or live can hear questions. So without any further ado, let's get started. There are basic ways that you can file transfers that are transfers. Uh, most of our time on the first, which is grid FTP, there's uh, three different flavors of that. And that's one that we have the largest growing interest in our ticket. It's very fast and it's very secure and it has a lot of flexibility. Uh, if, uh, the, this is called an art, by the way, because not every center has the same flavor of each file transfer. So without a standardization across the entire nation of national labs, universities, partnerships, there's little you have to do for each center. Not a center has all the equipment to be good at PC. The next one after that is something developed by Stanford called CDCP, file transfer protocol that's a lot like SDCP, that you're probably familiar with because it comes with every unit distribution. But it can multi streams and it has some options for setting up uh, some checking and so forth. It is the most commonly used file transfer protocol. Like I said, everywhere has it because it comes with a lot of distribution. And the first flavor is simply to transfer it to our archives. So all of our center systems, when we work on Titan or Kraken or any of these regional machines, they go into a temporary work directory that gets swept and put and purged every two weeks. So a good habit is to back up data on our high performance storage system or HPSS. And the language you do for transferring data between that and our computers is HSI or HTAR. So we'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Let's start with what grid FTP is. Performance, secure, reliable, transfer protocol. It is optimized for these wide area networks. So you may or may not know that the net labs are linked together by a couple of cell internet. Um, the exceed sphere, you have the teragrid, and I think that's becoming something else and being upgraded. A 10 gigabit connection that links the exceed facilities. For the national labs, you have the Department of Energy, or you have the Energy Sciences Network, or ESNet. That's a 100 gigabit connection that uh, all the national labs connect. And you can connect to both of those from the regular internet. Grid FTP is optimized to use these tools. First of all, the hardware and servers at each of our centers, but also through the fact that it can divide a large file up into many streams and transfer them in parallel. Um, it uses grid security, both on uh, control and data channels, and has data channels and pipelining. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to use that. Uh, lots and lots of documentation out there. If I go through one of these slides too quickly, don't worry. A lot of these are meant to be a resource to help you find documentation, and these slides will be provided. So here is the Grid FTP user guide. Grid FTP is uh, produced by the Globus team, and this is the primary link to their documentation for the Globus toolkit. That toolkit is installed on NICs and OLCS and XC machines. Um, in different ways. So you can go and search this documentation that is behind me or on the slide. Uh, documentation is a user's guide, and it has a lot of what I'm going to cover, plus much, much more. So there again, there's the address at the top of the slide if you want to go and check that out. There also has its own specialized grid FTP documentation. So there are the links to the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. Again, that's Titan. A uh, few other machines and the National Institute of Computational Sciences, Kraken and the Exceed machine. 
uh, nice examples that are picked up for your convenience. A lot of what I'm covering comes from those examples. So here's a good FTP. Globe Online is a software as a service that relies on a web interface. Globe Shell Copy is a command line tool, as well as Uber FTP. Uh, Nix and Exceed machines have Uber FTP. We no longer support that at a leadership facility. The protocol that we most like to use with Grid FTP is the JS FTP, which you can see at the bottom is the example for the Exceed machine, how you would connect using these command line protocols. You'll see more of that in a few examples in just a minute. Uh, GIS FTP has FTP a higher security standard and how that's implemented in just a minute. It's online. Globus Online uh, allows sort of this third party to help optimize your transfers. It's the easiest method once it's set up, and it's one of the fastest once it's set up. Basically, the user, that showing it there on the screen, yeah. the user oops, will uh, certify through these certificate authorities that they're, they're who they say they are, and they're running on the machine. That will set up securely with a procedure over in a minute. That user uh, allows the file system uh, they want to transfer from to be open to the Globus infrastructure, and Globus mediate transfer between the two centers. So that user is going to have to have some sort of authentication at the two ends of that transfer. And the one that we prefer at OLTS, and I believe this is more and more commonly preferred, is the grid certificate. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Other methods, you are probably familiar with SSH keys, where you have a private key that you keep very securely. You have a public key that's distributed on a couple of machines. Certificate is the more secure version of that. Um, so I you, when I say that it's a web interface, this is the web interface. You go to this address, and you would get an account, much like you would the social media or Google or something. It's a simple login where you set up a username and a password, and you change the password every few months. Uh, simple. See what it enables. Do we have a question? What's the question? It is very helpful if you have those tools installed. Uh, this Globus Online website has a client that you can download for your laptop if your center does not have the infrastructure. I'm going to go over what our centers have um, in terms of grid FTP servers and proc servers, which is what serves the authentication. Um, but yes, it's helpful if your university does have a dedicated infrastructure for this. And Globus, the Globus team will actually work with you if you contact with them through this website. Um, there are a lot of tools that are available on the website that's showing up on the screen for doing the transfer. So the thing for this is complicated, and you do need to have the correct tools. So I want to start the discussion by showing you what it can do. If you see a screen, this is after I've gotten all the setup done. I see all of my files that's in my project directory uh, that's being served on the OLCF cluster, so Titan, essentially, or our data transfer nodes in this case. And what I want to transfer those several gigabit files to my uh, user space. So this is a transfer on the same machine. Before, I would start these with SCP, and a lot of times it would fail, and I wouldn't know what I would have to start my run. With Globe, it'll just keep trying. I just select those big files that I want. I hit the arrow, and they go. And I can be pretty assured that they go over there. Globe actually does a check for the integrity of the data when it gets over. To the eyes. So I just want to show you the convenience. Now I'm going to show you the labor of the setup. This, uh, on on the picture on this slide, I have kind of a schematic off the Globus website of the infrastructure. And this is the live example I'm going to be given. In this case, let's assume that site A is NIC and site B is OLCS. So maybe I want to transfer something I ran on Prime to go work on Titan. I, I you know I have an allocation on both. Uh, site, uh, they will have set up a grid FTP server and a my proxy server. And um, the grid FTP is what allows the data to go quickly across the infrastructure. The my proxy server is what's going to 
this temporary authentication credential that allows you to get between the machines without having to use your RSA key. So you're probably familiar with uh, these keys that change numbers are one-time passwords that last for 30 seconds. Once you set this up, the My Proxy server will allow you to do multiple transfers for a full 12 hours before you have to re-authenticate again. Um, so let's try this example. First, I want to explain kind of what a grid certificate is. And the idea for this was that it would be like a passport. You would have a certificate authority that issued the certificate to all the centers. And if I got a certificate at one, I would be able to pass that ID, say, for LCS to nurse. And you can actually do that because they both accept the same time. But not every center accepts the same certificate authority certificate. For example, NICS had a very easy process where they immediately issue your proxy and you don't own your passport or your certificate. NICS believes on the basis of your username and your password. And I'll show you that process in a minute. Um, so different flavors of these certificates. And in order to get the center to talk to one another, who good at FTP, you have to have those certificates certified by the centers. They agree to accept each other's. Or you have to get your certificate registered with Globus Online as one that is acceptable at multiple centers. There's instruction on the Globus Online website for that. Um, give a certificate like a password that allows you to not have to use your one-time password key, or even your, you know, even if it's a university with a long-time password, you know, a password that can get you out of having to use that every time you initiate a new transfer for that period of time is specified. <coughs> The word Globus Online is as follows. First, you set up a certificate if the center app requires you to. OLCF requires this, and CS and Exceed do not require this. So you launch that certificate onto a proxy server. So you make this temporary version of that certificate that goes out and lives for two hours, usually, or less at the centers and allows you to do the transfer. Third, you attach to the Globus Online web infrastructure through that website that I showed you. Uh, this is what's called endpoints, and that's basically their category for an endpoint is basically something that has a grid FTP server, a proxy server, or some sort of authentication, and able to access the directory structure at both sides of your transfer, or actually at one side. So you have an endpoint for each side of your transfer. Uh, let me show you the next process. This is one of the easiest and Friendly. Uh, you can do this without logging into Kraken, but I am not part of the Exceed sphere because I'm the OLCX user assistant, so I just have the courtesy account and I have to log into Kraken. Actually, I believe that's not true. If you have the Globus tools installed on your laptop, Globus will have a solution that allows you to do it without logging into the machine. But it's very easy just to log into Kraken. The JASI certificate, uh, you'll do the My Proxy logon minus I. Minus S, and you give the name of the next my proxy server, which is myproxy.nix.uk.edu. And you RSA can token to update, and you're ready to do your transfers, either through the URL copy or uh, through Lobus Online. Now, the next process, they have their own proxy server. Exceed has a similar process, which I'm not covering here because it is similar and I don't have access to it. Uh, I'm going to do this live in just a minute. But this was steps one and two of that global workflow. Uh, well, we are a Department of Energy facility, so we have uh, two standards that do not allow us to set up a general proxy server. You have to have a data passport, essentially. <coughs> Our certificate authority um, is the Offline Information Management Certificate Authority, with OIM, on this certificate. You have to go to their website, which is the first step. This is just to get the certificate, step one of that workflow I showed you. Uh, that will give you, fill out your personal information. Don't be surprised if they call you, because they're going to certify that you are who you say you are. You just give uh, this certificate from a web link in a compressed, secure format. You use some of our tools uh, and global tools to extract that certificate to a public and a private key. You'll install these in a .globus file on our data transfer node and register your grid certificate with our systems group. So we keep very close tabs on 
on who uses which certificate. The advantage of that is if your certificate is compromised, only those things on that certificate are compromised, not if the proxy server is compromised. It's a little bit more difficult to trace. So that's one. It takes, it starts a little under a week. We're getting more efficient procedures. If the people aren't going to do data transfer the Department of Energy, then you're probably going to have to do a little setup to get your certificate. Our, uh, this is the generating of the proxy. So step two for our procedure, this is parallel to what NICS does. Once you have your certificate, every time you want to do a transfer, you'll log into our data transfer node, load the globe module, you'll do initialization that creates the proxy certificate. This is where, Nick, you come into the process on this. And you, you just here, there. And distribute your proxy certificate to our proxy server or, or using our scheduled TPM to compare compute nodes. You'll have to put it uh, in a server where the compute nodes can see it. Um, if there's ever a need for that, I have a whole other talk on how to do that. So, actually, these two steps, but I'm going to break here and go to a live demo. Here, uh, I am logged on to the data transfer node suite at OLTF, and I'm on Kraken. Whoops, I logged on to Kraken. Let me try that one again. Me trying to log in. Hmm. Is Kraken down? Yeah. Okay. To, well, Dart, the Dart, the Globus. Kraken's going to there, which is another thing. And then I did screen passes. Um, so I'm meeting with my RSA. Not necessarily. All right. So for next, I will try to get my proxy certificate with uh, with my proxy on. Centers. When you username. Name. Okay, that's for what it wants is your RSA code. So your and then you get your trustee. Credential has been received. So I've done step one and two of the Globus workflow there. Um, all LCF, I've already gone through that week process of setting up the certificate. So what I have to do here is just initialize the proxy and distribute it. So I'm going to do that with it. You know password uh, for every logon. If you don't specify, mine is going to make you enter the password for every operation. It's kind of keeping the purpose. Oops. Forgot you have to module load globus. Step is a passphrase that you set up that goes with that data passport that you requested. Okay, valid for seven days. That is no longer true because of our security. You can't count on these for any machine and any center being valid for more than 12 hours. <clears throat> Everybody's trying to adjust to reflect that. On OLCF, if I have to distribute the proxy, my proxy log on. OK, 
And this time, passphrase it once my OLTF. Uh, if I'm not explaining the numbers, then I'm sure you won't see it. Okay. Uh, is I have certified that I am who I say I am with my proxy certificate and I have distributed a temporary proxy certificate to my one-time passwords and passphrases keys and they're both on proxy servers at the mix and all What does is it allows Globus to know that I can do a transfer so I'm Globus online website. I'm going to set up my account. <clears throat> okay, I'm logged in. I'm going to go to manage data transfer. And I'm site A with Nick, so I will do there's order and Okay, well, I'll do one on this side. It doesn't matter if I do one. OLCF managed endpoint that we maintain at the center is OLCF pound CTN, data transfer mode. There, we need to uh, reference that it's sitting on the OLCF proxy server, so you're going to use your RSA key as the passphrase for this and your OLCF username. That's your center you're going to center username and passphrase unless they have a different structure. Okay, hold on. So I'm authenticating with my RSA key. Okay. The Dot uh, and he'll use my uh, Nick username and Nick uh, RSAD. And as you my files now on both systems, and I can change directory. Like if I want to go to project directory, and so there, and these are C runs that are big data files. So they're going to be in the gigabyte range. Not transfer with SDC because they're much files. Alright, I pick whichever I want to transfer and I fire them over to Nick so I can control the fired a few site files on Nick. Uh, transfer request, and I'm going to get an email from Globus when these are done. And it's going to give me the transfer rate and if tech summing was done. So it's extremely convenient, even if there is a little bit of setup cost. Everything is did live. I have screen captures on the slides, so I'm about to skip through a bunch of my presentation uh, as we did live. So. Uh, so the endpoint shows you how to get on, how to log, and it's for. All right, that takes us to the next flavor of grid FTP, which is Globus URL copy. This one, do your own optimization, right? So Globus does all that for you. Then maybe you feel like you have a little more control. It's also scriptable. So if you have a script that you want to run on uh, or Titan and you want to call another script to do an automatic data transfer, you can do that with the copy provided that your authentication and your proxy credentials will be valid when your job runs and completes. So that's here with using scriptably is 
when I set up those endpoints and when I activated my proxy, I only have 12 hours before I have to do that again. So ostensibly, you might be waiting in a huge long time, maybe a couple days before this comes up. So you would have to make sure that you activate your proxy to actually use this explicitly. Of course, several different protocols. The preferred one, at least at OLCF, is GIS FTP because it has security protocols, but it supports FTP, HTTP, HTTPS, and Local transfers, you can use the file uh, protocol. What's the question? Do you have to put RSA keys every time you want to have the call? Do you to wait 12 hours if you can That's correct. Uh, about every 12 hours, you have to re-authenticate the uh, process that I just went through. But then for the whole 12 hours, you're open on Globus Online. You're all open with Globus URL copy if you're using the certificate of authentication. Measures still allow SSH authentication of the Globus URL copy. OLCF does not. I don't think they do this. They do uh, SSH authentication. We have been allowing it. Um, they still have uh, some of that, but it is going away. The keys? Okay. First, uh, I just did transfer to nurse, and they, they have the one time password. They have the password for months to can set up SSH authentication with them. But the key side, you can do for a long time. But that's not a Okay. What Daniel just said that is that he will allow you to request certificates that last up to a week. As I think that's one of the stricter security outlines of National Labs, because we're a department. Okay, so see how this works. Uh, on all our systems, track and Titan are clicked. You can type command and then type that help, and that will get you the option. So that's what's displaying on the screen. Also, the Grid FTP user's guide has uh, a lot of information that kind of explains what bridge version that you can get when you type help is for these command line tools. Also, I want to point you to is our sets of documentation. Um, and OLCF have dedicated examples and documentation for global URL copy and for low mine. So here, this is what you find if you went to those documentation. Uh, a bunch of optional command line switches, which do make a big difference in the speed of the transfer. And we'll talk about those in a minute. You have to give a source URL uh, after the protocol and a destination URL. Uh, URL format is the protocol. Are these guys down at the bottom of the slide? Um, plus uh, the host and the path. Uh, if you're trailing, it will be considered a directory, so just be aware that you don't want to transfer your directory, you might want to keep that in mind. Again, there's the protocols, the preferred one at OPS, at least, is FTP. So, talk a little bit about those options. The first useful one, if you're just starting out, is the proposal. The VD, so that will have you show what the transfer is doing. It will tell you a lot of information. So this is good. Sometimes it takes a few surprises to get the, the format right, and this will tell you how you want a stray. This is a raster, so this isn't transferring data out to the wide area network like ESNet or TerraGrid. This is dividing up your files over your local system. So if you if Stripe, it allows that if your servers allow that. Uh, key specifies the number of parallel data connections. This is where you're really going to change the speed with this method. And then buffer size. So the data cam channel is reusable. Basically, here's my two ends of my transfer. I have a chunk, I send it, and I, can, I have another chunk waiting to go in the buffer. And if you can size those properly, you'll have a constant stream that aren't colliding. If you don't size them properly, it can slow you down. But that parameter is less of an effect than uh, than the number of streams. And Daniel has done a nice analysis that I'll show you. So setting it is critical for the wide area network. Wide area network, 10 gigabit, 100 gigabit connection. So you really want to fill up that pipe with those parallel streams and getting buffer size appropriate for getting the flow of data right. right. A slide uh, that's taken from a paper that shows the effect of the parallel streams. And this varies over the time of day, but this is a general trend that really don't start to get good performance until you're above six. 
and they're going to saturate somewhere around 10 or 16. So uh, the lesson here is don't just do well. Yes, two screens is better than one, but six, eight, ten is going to be way better than two. A um, hundred of you, much. Okay. So that's a, the thing about the two parameter. Here's the thing that Daniel did of the buffer size. So we have a long boxes that comes across the screen here, the buffer size. And the axis, we have the number of parallel screens. And going vertically, we have the transfer of megabytes per second. And take away from this, I know there's a lot on this plot, but the takeaway is, is that if you look along that first rung, the buffer size doesn't make a lot of difference. Like if you hit this right, you might spike and get some peaks. It doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, well, the slides are not changing. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You want me to? Yeah. How are they giving you what they're seeing? Yeah. Still frozen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can change. doesn't seem to enter. Okay, I think it's getting slow. Buffer size. So on, on this at the bottom, uh, have five point uh, increase, and then we have parallel well, streams increasing and the bandwidth. So how much data I'm pushing through that pipe. This is a nice plot that Daniel did in the study. Um, so the buffer size doesn't make very big difference. If you hit it just right, you'll get some pop up. That could be even just the network. Uh, the, the file transfer speed varies greatly depending on what other people are doing on it. Uh, just as long as your buffer size isn't so small as to choke the transfer, you're good. In fact, again, is the screen. You can see that 16, uh, uh, 12 and 16 are all much higher than 4 and 6. So, going. Uh, proxy certificate. So, here is an example. I'm not going to go live, uh, especially with technical issues coming up, but a grid proxy in it, so this initial proxy, this is the next process. For here, you would have to use that complicated process. Do we have a question? Okay. Um, but here is that format, uh, Globus URL 
copy anything for Bo, tell us what the transfer is doing. There's right if we have the ability to stripe our thing over Lester to get it out to the land, why network will do it. We're going to use 12 streams with a buffer size of 11 megabytes. And the, we'll use the GIS FTP protocol. There is the address for NICS, gridftp.nix.utk.edu. The port was 2811. Then we give the file. So we're going to Daniel's home directory and transfer it to the bit file. We do a byte file. there. And to our destination, which is on Ranger, and put the location uh, where we want to put that file on Ranger and the file name again. We hit enter. This is what you're going to see. You'll see what the source is and the destination because we specified for both. And the tell you every so often an update on how fast the transfer goes. This transfer happened at 23 megabytes per second. You were just in the middle of the night, maybe at a faster rate. Okay, if you do it in the middle of the day, maybe you'll get a slower rate. It just depends on the network is at. That said, uh, the Exceed Sphere has something that I absolutely love. And I wish that we had this between all the national labs, but it's a forecast for the data speed between machines. Go to this page, when the share grid for machine, you'll have the machine and then the destination, and somewhere a test is being run for how fast. These transfers are in gigabits per second, and you can see you know, how fast they are. Do that for all of their machines. I think that's a wonderful tool. So, you know, if you have to move something big, maybe if this is showing slow in the middle of the day, maybe you'll just wait and do it at night scriptably or, you know, write a note to yourself to do it after dinner. Has grid FTP. I said you can go to Globus on the Globus on Toolkit and Globus and get tools that you download for your specific laptop. But if you have to go between centers and one doesn't have it, the next option is the BBTC. So this is developed at Slack or Stanford, and the the native documentation for it lives at Stanford. So there's the link. Um, it's a multi-streaming file transfer. It's a syntax that's kind of similar to Globus URL copy. Again, on all of our machines, if you type BBTC minus H, you'll get the abridged version of the help. Um, so here are those options. This, this is the fan size. These are probably the most common ones. The one really going to uh, use to control are most likely going to be the number of parallel streams S. Our defaults are four, both of our centers. Um, that buffer, again, the default 64. And um, the option. Oh, uh, something that is interesting when you're dealing with centers with different firewalls is Z. So this this resource A has to be installed at both centers. Um, you can push or pull. So if you specify, uh, you can do a reverse connection for target source depending on what the firewalls are set. Sometimes you have to use that option. You'll see people like connection refuse. There'll be an error message. And one of the things you always try when you get that is to throw the minus C. Other important options A and K allow your transfer to reply if it fails. So you can set it, keep it, it just doesn't sit there if it fails. Um, our is copy, and of course, D is verbose, so you know what the transfer is doing. Uh, kind of syntax as Globus URL copy, where you have options. Um, you list the source and the file name, and then the destination and the file name. The copy format is familiar, probably, because it's similar to <coughs> Uh, Daniel, excuse me. Daniel did a very nice study of how these different parameters impact the transfer rate. And here, a buffer size running along the bottom, parallelisms running along the back, and the transfer rate in kilobytes per second this time. Uh, a, a study of transfers that he did, and you can see that, that the biggest difference again is the parallel streams. So. Uh, we get a really big difference here with it looks like three and seven. Like the difference between these is is quite a shame. So area area network that helps you fill up the data pipe. Uh, buffer size again is kind of sporadic. If you get it right, you get it right. You wrong, it's diminished. That and trial or error for the specific transfers 
that you're in between centers. And I study like that uh, with some people from SciComp at OLF, the scientific computing group that I'll start with at the end. Um, so through the uh, examples here, I give in our documentation from our centers with lots of helpful examples right here. And here's just a few uh, sort of or examples to do the path. So EBCP, the path to the file, remote address, path, file name. That's the simplest possible one. That doesn't, you know, that's just all our default. I get fancier. You specify a pay for. for Try again, fail. You specify an S to give you seven streams. You specify a W to give you a four megabyte buffer. And then this T prints out updates. So all of these file transfers will give you an update every so often. Uh, that's nice if you're trying to do a speed set. Or nice to turn it off if you don't want that information plugged. The speed if it can make a difference. Uh, this for protocol relies on and the remote system that you're going to passively having the right path to where BBC is installed upon it. And that's often not the case. So one that you can do is use this capital T option to SSH XA file back to our or to the shell equals no. This is a standard option that comes with the BBC documentation. You specify this T and then that sort of third set of options. You can find the path to BBC on the remote, uh, remote file. That's very useful. That's often something that you have to do when going between national labs or national lab and university. Uh, BBC is distributed, so say you did want to use it at a place that didn't have it. Uh, if you're saying you can install it with your whole project directory, and there's that minus T option to direct the transfer to find it uh, when you're going between the centers. So you can always have a multi-streaming option, no matter how, no matter what centers you're going to. Um, I'll just to point out something that Nick has uh, that's very useful. They have an enhanced uh, in SCP, which is a version of SCP. It's still just one stream, but this version has the ability to control buffer size, and there's also a nice GUI. Really need to use, and SCP is universal. I'm not going to go through the protocols because they look very much like BCP with the option for multi streaming and so, so forth. SCP on almost every system. So if you absolutely can't use the multi streaming method, there's your fallback. And abundant documentation both on our website and uh, if you type SCP, it's, it's very easy to use. So I give them the address to the NIST SCP examples because I think that's particularly nice. Um, we have LCS as well, but I could not find it on. In fact, they're very similar to the NIST example. All right, we did a study at OLCS with a transfer to NERSC using all of these different copy tools. And all of our copy tools run through our data transfer nodes on to the Energy Sciences Network. So they all have a 100 gigabit net area connection. Um, there were two sets of hardware that we used for the study. We have interactive data transfer nodes. That's the thing that you have to log into to get your globe and set up the set up certificate and launch proxy. We also have scheduled data transfer nodes, we two of them, that are accessible from uh, Titan compute nodes and, in fact, the other clusters like Geo and Sony uh, Rea. So, what you can do uh, there is have a job that scripts those on those. Brand data transfer nodes, and they happen to be the newest hardware we have with the most advanced capabilities so they tend to be faster than all of the other data transfers that we have. Uh, the study for the rate in megabytes per second to transfer file starting at 11 kilobytes all the way up to 32. We actually did a terabyte as well, but that in a study has not been published yet. Um, and we found that. The fastest that we do was with BBCP or Globus URL copy on our scheduled BTN. I've just given you this example about Globus and giving you a big feel of how it's fast and neat. And look, it's a little slower. Well, it's really not. The thing that we use for Globus is the timing that they give you when the file is done. Go online does a bunch of checks to make sure that your data, the integrity was maintained. And the thing of the file, the longer those checks take, 
that's in a time that it gives you. So as the rate of transfer uh, raw to Globus it compares to these other three methods. Here, like these three methods, but you're also getting checked. So that's why it's there. Weeks for SCP, uh, the average rates during the day, and it takes more than 12 hours to do one nearby transfer, even scheduled data transfer nodes. So it's a lot of data to move. You really want to do these streaming methods. By comparison, when we use the BBCP or mobile oil copy on our scheduled DPM to transfer a terabyte, it's over an hour. So a lot of data, you really want to use these multi-streaming methods, either grid FTP or BBCP. Method I just want to mention because it's extremely important if you want to back up data, and this is uh, true for both OLCS and NIC, is the HI format. Uh, HI is a uh, set of commands called scripts that was written specifically for our NIC high performance storage system. And HI help will give you the abridged version. Both the NIC and OLCF pages have excellent documentation on how to use this and its features. Um, HR is a command that will actually parse the file and put it on the HPSS. You really have to put your production runs from any of these machines on the HPSS if you want just the data. Uh, you can also move them to a project space, but like OLCF is moving to purging project spaces as well as. So you're really going to want to keep your data either on the HPSS or someplace that doesn't get purged. So the basic syntax is very easy. Uh, put and get are the uh, put and retrieve commands from the HPSS. You can enter that from Kraken or from Titan, and it will automatically go to the HPSS and get or put your data. Um, trials, you're going to want to... Uh, or HR them. So those are the command syntaxes there. HTAR has the same uh, syntax as regular TAR. So you want to C to TAR it, C for verbose, and I guess F file. And that will that will put the, on the HPSS. It does not erase it from your home directory, so you can do that by hand. Um, an HRXDF, issue that from Titan or Kraken, and that will automatically go get your data from the HPSS. I you know the HPSS has lots of robots that have to pull tapes in and out of a drive, um, make a few minutes. Actually, it's supposed to be six seconds, or it seems to be getting faster these days. But so, yeah, issue these commands, you may, may have to wait for just a little while. Uh, okay, any questions? Also, a note, I didn't go through it, but I do have uh, some extra slides for Uber FTP for Nick. Uh, examples here at the end of the slide presentation, if that, that would be what you prefer. It's very much like Logan's URL copy, uh, but once you get the slides, you can see that. Do we have any questions? for attending and uh, I guess we'll see you on with introduction to shell programming thank you